This is The Bass Life with me, John Cruz. So if you love bass fishing, this is for you. This is going to be a series on like a podcast style format, I guess, on kind of everything bass fishing. We're going to have people on and we've got a special guest today, but we're going to have people on that are just like us. They love bass fishing. They're eat up with it. They're consumed with it. Maybe they fish tournaments. Maybe they don't. Maybe they fish kayak. Maybe they fish from the bank. Maybe they fish from boats. Whatever it is, bass fishing is their life. So that's why we call it Bass Life. And we're going we're gonna to have a little sit down, talk through a bunch of different things, and just try to educate and entertain and, and make a fun experience here for, for all of us. And we've got, a, like I said, spare, a very special guest today. Somebody who's extremely famous, known worldwide, um, does an amazing job, very recognizable, amazing job on uh, you know, behavioral health for, for children, mainly, uh, especially during December, but that's kind of his, his deal. But he's a big bass fisherman for the rest of the year. Most people don't know that. When he goes away for 11 months of the year, he, uh, he is a huge bass fisherman. And so I want to uh, introduce a good friend of mine, uh, Mr. Elf on the Shelf. Man, he, sometimes he does this. He'll just freeze up when he thinks people are watching. You want to talk about bass fishing today or no? Okay. Alrighty. I guess we're not going to interview Mr. Elf. I mean, if you want to just chime in anytime, buddy, you let us know, okay? Okay. I guess I'm going to interview myself then. Because um, he's not going to do anything. He might chime in from time to time, but again, maybe not. But we're just going to, we're going to talk to you. And I'll just go ahead and ask myself these questions because uh, we're going to get a feel for the format and I might as well do, do myself first because I'm going to be on every episode and nobody cares what I think except for me. No, not really. But uh, anyway, we're going to have fun with this. But the first question that we're going to get, get to, no matter who's on this couch or no matter who is here, is how did you get into bass fishing? And for me, bass fishing was something that my dad didn't do. Nobody in my family really close to me was really kind of into, except the fact that I grew up out in the middle of the country in Amelia County, Virginia, in a little town called Jetersville, and we had some had some land there, and we had a pond on the land. And we went out there, and when I was just a little a little fart, or okay, all right, when I was smaller than I am now, should say younger, uh, we'd go out there and we catch bluegill, and this is a tiny pond. I'm talking, you could cast all the way across it, and we'd catch bluegill. Sometimes we'd catch little bass, and it was it was. I, mean, I loved to go out there. I mean, I'd go out there all summer, and you know, a couple times a week. And then one day, I was probably 10 or 12 years old, I went out there with a soft plastic worm, I think it was a little ribbon tail, and I threw over next to, next to some cattails, I'll never forget it, threw over there, and my line started moving. I said, well, I got a little bass, and I set the hook. And I thought this fish was Moby Dick. I thought it was a giant. It was really only about a three pounder. And man, that fish jumped and it tail walked. I'll never forget it. it. Tail walked like 20 feet down the middle of this pond, all the way down, and it was pulling and pulling drag. I'd never had a fish pull drag like that before, and my heart was racing. And so I got this fish all the way up to the bank, and then I, I, I lipped it and got it up. And right then, I knew I have got to catch more of these. I need to go to different ponds. This pond is so small. I need to go to different ponds. So then. Uh, I, I was talking to my dad into taking me to other people's ponds. We had a good friend not too far away. We used to go to his pond. And then uh, one of the guys that uh, would, would work around the property a little bit uh, from time to time, help cut grass and things, he was a big bass fisherman. So Willie Logan was his name. So Willie and I, man, we hit it off. We, we just hit it off going bass fishing uh, together. We would go to all these different ponds in the area neighborhood i mean you know within 30 minutes man we were we were killing it and uh, and then it just kind of grew from there 
started fishing uh, bigger bodies of water because I was reading Bassmaster magazine and, and things like that. So the the magazines really wanted my you know got my interest into to wanting to go to other other bodies of water, other places to to fish, and wanted to really you know, just expand my horizons. I felt like I was catching all these, all these pond bass, but I wanted to be like Denny Brower and Kevin Van Dam and, you know, Tommy Biffle and uh, Larry Nixon and Rick Clun. I mean, just, you know, the, the names that I was reading in Bassmaster Magazine, I wanted to do the same things they were doing. I wanted to go to Sam Rayburn. I wanted to go to Lake Gunnersville. I wanted to go to the Bugs Island there in Virginia, North Carolina border, uh, which I've fished a, a ton since uh, since back in those days. So by the time I was about 15, I talked, my dad loves being on the water, but he still at this point was no, he, he could care less about catching a bass, uh, but he loved being on the water. So he bought a 17 foot, John, uh, not John boat, but a 17 foot little nitro bass boat. And, you know, we took that thing all over, you know, me and dad would take it around, me and Willie would take it around. And then my cousin, who's 15 years older than me, Charles Morris, he, Charles and I started uh, going different places, and then Charles introduced, at the time I was 15, introduced me to a good friend of mine, still a good friend of mine to this day, uh, Rick Hawkins, and Rick Hawkins had fished against Jay Ellis and uh, all those kind of guys. He moved out west for a while, originally from Virginia, but uh, he introduced me to, to Rick, and then the tournament thing started to get real, like I'd, I really wanted to fish a tournament. And then, and then uh, Charles and I saw where there was a tournament coming up on Smith Mountain Lake, open team tournament, 10 bass limit back in those days, 10 fish limit, can you believe it? It's kind of crazy to think about. So Charles and I, I was 15, Charles was again 15 years older than me, he's 30. We, we were like, all right, we're gonna go do this. We're gonna, we're gonna go to this, this tournament and we're just gonna, you know, we're gonna do well. So this was in the heyday of Smith Mountain Lake, right? We go out and we caught four bass. And back then, we, you could have uh, two of your bass, I believe it was, could be 12 inches and the rest had to be 14 inches. So we had two that were between 12 and 14 inches and then we had two that were over 14 inches. And I think we had, we had a total of, I don't know, it was a solid like seven and a half pounds maybe. Um, you know, so we, uh, we didn't set the world on fire and and you know we were proud, man. We took those fish up to the scales, and, and put them down. And I'll never forget uh, just the the way the whole thing went down. There were 20, 30 people in there that had the 10 fish limit. It took 33 pounds to win that tournament, and we had seven. Uh, but from the first thing that Charles and I talked about, as soon as we got back, we had so much fun. What what tournament are we gonna fish next? You know, what are we going to do next? We're going to fish another team tournament. We're going to fish another, you know, pro-am. We do some red man. So we, we found out about these red man. So now they're called BFLs. Found out about these red man tournaments that, that were at Smith Mountain Lake, James River, Bugs Island, Lake Gasson, all those lakes within, you know, hour, hour and 20 minutes of where I live there in Amelia. And, man, we just, we, you know, we set out to, to start fishing those. And, and we did. And, and we fished them as a co-angler. And then things just kind of, Kind of grew from there but that you know that's really how i got into the 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 tournament fishing scene that's how i fished my first tournament uh, and i'm pretty sure if i remember correctly the first bass i caught in a tournament was on a shallow running shad wrap now this was something that charles and i would go to different ponds and just roast them on because it's a, it's a real subtle uh lip style design and a real subtle wiggle. It's not like the regular shad wrap. And if you throw a regular shad wrap in a pond, usually it just get gummed up on the bottom. But if you threw the shallow running version, it would stay up off the bottom and you could catch them. So that's what we had confidence in fishing all these ponds for the last few years. Then we go to Smith Mountain Lake and you know we're just fishing we're fishing this deep on Smith Mountain Lake, which you know has a hundred and some feet deep. You know, a lot of the fish or in that two to 12 foot range, man, we weren't even getting close to a lot of them fish, but um, it, was, it, was, it was awesome. It was a lot of fun and I'll, I'll never, never forget that, uh, that first tournament. So that, that next year, yeah, we were, we were, you know, just eat up with it, just have, having a lot of fun for the next three or four years, just really, really enjoyed it. 
It wasn't until I was probably 18 years old that I got really serious about wanting to do more tournaments. And, and I mean, I just really had fun with it. Uh, but by the time I was 18, I was graduating from high school and I was going to college. You know, and all through all through high school, I played sports. You know, I played baseball all the way through. Played basketball until I was a junior. I just lost interest in that. And I played golf. I loved golf and baseball. Those were my two two uh, two favorite sports growing up. And I played those all the way through high school. But once I was through high school, I didn't know I didn't know if I wanted to play those sports in college. I just didn't know if I was going to have the desire to want to to really dedicate myself. I knew it was the next level of competition, but it takes the next level of dedication too. Uh, so I really kind of had this. I don't know how you want to refer to it. It's like a, I didn't know what I wanted to do with that. So in college, I didn't play any sports, but I still had this competitive itch, and and there there was this tournament bass fishing thing, and all of a sudden all of my all of my energy went boom, went right into this tournament bass fishing thing, and I I was eat up with it, and that's all I wanted to do. So after about two years of doing that, you know, in college. I, I was like, this is what I want to do for a living. I want to be a professional bass fisherman. I want to make my living in the fishing industry. I had met a lot of great people. I had met this guy named Larry Staler uh, and his wife, Linda. They treated me like one of their kids. I'm still friends with Linda and Larry, uh, but they, they treated, you know, he was my first draw in that very first Redman tournament. He introduced me to Dr. Greg South, who was another friend. Uh, Dr. South took me under his wing, another mentor, and uh, you know between Rick Hawkins and, and and Greg South, I mean they really gave me the fundamentals of of how to bass fish at the next level before I graduated college. I mean th those two, I would fish with both of them quite a bit. I fished with Rick a lot, a lot of tournaments. I fished with Dr. South on a more casual level. Dr. South is like you know. He taught me a ton about Texas rig fishing, uh, fishing slow, fishing sl with a spinning rod, that kind of stuff. And then Rick, definitely much more of a power fisherman. He is probably best known for, for deep cranking. And uh, there's no doubt Rick gave me a huge um, lesson, probably like a collegiate degree, if you will, on, on how to deep crank. And then, you know, Rick's a big spinnerbait guy, shallow crankbait guy as well. And um, so he gave me that, that kind of education going forward. So when I graduated college and I was ready to go out there and, and fish on the Bassmaster uh, Opens or Invitationals it was back then. It wasn't even the Opens. That's how long ago it was. Uh, so that's kind of where I, where I started there. But it wasn't, you know, soon after starting to fish those tournaments, we had a we always would start the season in the fall. Fall is awesome for for shallow crankbait fishing, and soon into my collegiate career, I I realized shallow. I loved shallow cranking, and I would say the first ten years of my career, that was my fallback. That I, I threw a shallow crankbait probably forty percent of all of my tournament days, and that's what I was that's what I was comfortable doing. So I think early on that was definitely my, my strong suit. I had this college degree, if you will, education of deep cranking. And then uh, once we started moving the tournaments to the spring, I just started getting eat up with, with bed fishing and catching fish off, off beds. And so I've got this weird combination, I feel like of shallow crank, deep crank, and, and sight fishing are kind of like my top three favorite techniques to uh, to do, and, and you know, and still that's to this day. But I consider myself a you know very versatile angler. I don't have any technique that I despise doing. If I think that there's a bass that's going to catch it, I mean, spy bait, you know, drop shot, neko rig, it doesn't matter. Ned rig. If I think I can catch one on that technique and it's you know i've been beat by it especially i'm going to try to learn it and i'm not opposed to it light line heavy line you know doesn't matter i love punching punching heavy weights and all that so i i consider myself pretty versatile but even going back to my to my roots 
you know, shallow cranking, deep cranking, and, and sight fishing are probably my my favorite favorite techniques. And um, I don't know, if, you know, we'll talk to, to talk about sight fishing, and you know, specifically, there's there's a lot of misconceptions out there about about sight fishing. A lot of people that don't understand it, they say, "Oh, I hate sight fishing." It's probably because you don't understand it. That, that'd be my be my guess. And the, I think the first tip or first lesson, and when you know those fish are spawning, you you're going around the bank and you see fish on beds, your first inclination should not be to, "Oh my God, I've got to catch every one of these fish that I see," because that's not always the best thing. Sometimes when the fish are spawning and you know they're spawning, you're much better off to just fish for them. Not, don't look at them, just fish in those areas that you know those fish are spawning. That is a huge, huge deal. Um, and sometimes both techniques can be successful. You can catch them visually sight fishing for them, or you can catch them just fishing. I remember uh, years ago, it was one, you know, one of the first years that it was actually the Elite Series. We had a tournament in March on Sam Rayburn. Never seen Sam Rayburn in my life. And I had a friend of mine, um, Mark Martin, show me at least just how to run around the lake. He said, you know, I like this one area. I fish in there a lot. Um, but it was, a huge, you know, really big area. Nothing real specific. So when I, we came back, the first morning of practice, I looked, uh, I dropped the trolling motor, uh, was pitching these bushes because it was just a little bit of water in the bushes. Pitching the bushes, I got hung up. And so I get, I get up there, and man, it was just barely light. So I get up there to un, un, undo my, my bait that was hung in that bush, and I looked and I saw a fish parked on a bed. It's probably a three pounder. And for some reason in my mind, I thought, that's it. As soon as I get enough light, I'm just going to look for bed and fish. That's it. So all I did was, for three days of practice, I just looked and found bedding fish. And I had a great tournament, ended up finishing sixth place in that tournament. But the tournament was won by Greg Hackney. Greg Hackney was catching spawning bass, but he was not looking at them. He was fishing in a different section of the lake where it was a little dirtier, but he was throwing a, uh, a Cinco or Ocho, striking Ocho, one or the other. Uh, he was throwing that weightless and he was throwing it in shallow bushes, the same type places that I was catching these, vis visually catching these sight fish in a little clearer water, he was catching them by, by fishing really slow. He's pitching in there and just leaving it. And then they, those fish were bedding. They, they would just eat that bait. And uh, he won by a pretty good margin, if I remember right. Uh, so that, that's a good example of kind of like, you don't have to visually sight fish for them, but you can. Both can be successful. And uh, that's just uh, hopefully a little lesson you can, you can take with you on the, on the sight fishing tip. But, um, but you know, fishing for so many years full time it's been uh, a lot of crazy things a lot of crazy things happen on the water but i can tell you just this past year one of the craziest things i've ever had happen was up on uh, lake st Clair. awesome 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 place to fish if you've never been up to uh the detroit area gone up there and fished on uh, lake st Clair, i highly encourage it unbelievable smallmouth fishing unbelievable uh, and I love to deep crank, as I mentioned earlier, and you can deep crank those smallmouth and, and smash them. Uh, you know, this past year, this live scope thing kind of dominated, but normally you can act really, really crush them on, the, on a deep crank bait. So in practice, I was just, I was going around, catching them on deep, you know, deep crank, and I had some different areas picked out. During the tournament, didn't have a very good first day. During the second day, I was going, I was just fishing a lot of new water, just, just going. And I got in this one area and I caught one. Then a few minutes later, I caught another one. Then a few minutes later, I caught another one. And I was like, man, this, this area has got a bunch. I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to hit the little patch of four pounders because I'm catching, you know, three pounders, you know, two and a half, three pounders, which is not what you need at Lake St. Clair. You need four pounders or better to do anything. So I go out there and, and then I hook one and I was like, man, there's one. I feel it's decent. And then it just kind of got funny. I didn't feel any big surge or anything. And then I just started reeling it in and I'm reeling it in real quick. And I see it's, an, you know, another two and a half pounder. But then as I, as I flipped the fish in the boat, 
I realize something has almost chopped this fish entirely in half. Blood is shooting everywhere. It was crazy. What happened was right after I hooked that fish, a muskie must have come up and chomped down on that smallmouth, almost cut that fish in half like like it had a giant uh, machete and just wah, just chopped it right in half, dude. Crazy. Like I said, blood was flying all over the boat. Uh, so I showed it, I showed it to the GoPro and, and got some really, really crazy footage. And and I I did I would not have kept that fish. It was a, it was smaller than anything in my live well at the time. So I quickly released it. Technically, it was still alive, but we all know that fish was not gonna live it fed some turtles or, or something, or that maybe that muskie came back and, and ate it. But, um, but kind of a, kind of a crazy deal. I've never, uh, never had anything like that happen to me before. I mean, I've had all kind of other, other wild things happen. You know, I was fishing one area with a shaky head one time and, and I thought, I thought I had a bass and I fought it about halfway back to the boat when I realized something wasn't right. And, and then I reeled it in and I had caught a beer can the whole entire shaky head and worm had gone in the mouth, not one of them giant mouths, but like a regular mouth on a beer can. The whole thing had gone into the mouth of that beer can and I, would, I had reeled it in. And all I did was I took my line and dipped it in there and shook it to straighten it back out and it pulled it straight out. I could fish, I probably fished 50 lifetimes and never have anything like that happen again. Just, just kind of like crazy freak stuff that, that happens when you're on the water. but. Uh, you know, so the last thing that I was going to talk to you, uh, to everybody about in this, uh, this format would be, what's your next goal? Like what, what is next on your agenda? What is next on my agenda? Whoever's going to be joining me from now on, we're going to dive into whatever is in their focus, what is in their, their crosshairs going forward in the immediate future. So I can tell you for me, after having a bad year on the Elite Series in 2020, my focus is to have a very good year in 2021. And the next year, that's that's my immediate goal. Fish as well as I can in every single one of those tournaments. You know, um, I feel like I was starting to turn things around towards the end of the season in, uh, in, in 2020. I'm gonna try to turn it around and you throw it out of the gate and not have any bad tournaments uh, and try to have as good a good a tournaments in every single event. So I feel like I, I spent a lot of time preparing for each tournament beforehand, uh, just getting mentally in the game with with each tournament that I'm going to go to. Uh, I don't have to worry about the Bassmaster Classic this year because I didn't make it. I didn't fish good enough to make it. Should not have made it. I need to, to I get that out of the way. Um, you know, I kind of have the you know, I've got missile baits and my family and everything else and sponsors and all that stuff going on. But as far as the tournaments go, I'm going to continue to do my preparation like I have been doing. Uh, I'm going to get my new boat here soon. I'm going to be running all electronics on that. Stay tuned for more uh, more videos definitely on, on that situation. I'm going to be running all three brands next year. A little change of pace. I'll explain all that later. But I'm going to have some new things. Uh, in my fishing life, you know, those electronics will be one of them. Uh, so I'm going to try to take everything and, and make it fit together for the way I fish. And I, I know how a couple of the electronics changes I'm making are going to fit into the way I, I like to fish. And, and I'm thinking that that's going to really make me more efficient on the water, uh, make me see things that I've not been seeing. And for the way that I fish on certain bodies of water, I think it's going to be a big help. Uh, so, so that's really my focus is just to have a jam up, jam up, jam up 2021 year on the water uh, and have the tournament results to be consistent. No bombs. I want to have, I want to fish all, all eight or nine elite series events, whatever we end up with when we get the schedule. Every one of those, I'm going to have top 40s. I do not want to have one single. If I have one tournament finish that's below 40th, I'm going to be pretty upset because I feel like that if I do my preparation, I mean, I'm smart about my practices, practicing the right areas, doing the right stuff, and keep an open mind. There's no reason I shouldn't be able to have a top 40 in every single one of those uh, tournaments. So make it day three, 
on, on all the tournaments. So that's my focus is to make top 40s every single tournament all year long. And I'm going to have a great, I'll obviously make the classic easily. I'm going to have, hopefully I have a couple top 10s. Uh, that'll be, I think that'll kind of come with the territory of making all those day threes. You'll make a few day fours. And, um, you know, to, to say, oh, I want to win a tournament. I want to win the angler of the year. If it's your time to do either one of those, it's going to happen. So that's what my focus is just to make sure I make day threes every single time. And, and I'm going to have a, have a great, great season coming up this next year. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody watching this first episode here, and I appreciate uh, my friend Elf on the Shelf here for hanging out with us. Uh, Elf, he's a big bass fisherman. He, big fan of the drop shot. Didn't know if anybody, i just go ahead and let that slip out. He's a big fan of the drop shot. So, um, yeah, Elf on the Shelf, big drop shot fan. Who knew that? But we're going to bring you all kind of other... Uh, other guests that actually will do some talking and we'll have some interaction and some banter and, and have a lot of fun. So if there's anybody specific that you want to see on, on The Bass Life, let me know. Drop it down there in the comments. Anything else that we didn't talk about here, we're going to talk about with other people, let me know. Anything you want to see, uh, let me know on this in the comments. We appreciate you watching and look forward to seeing you on more editions of Bass Life.